Uh, 56, we'll read Luke chapter 1, 39 to 56, and the whole section which begins just after Mary had had a visit from the angel Gabriel who told her what was just about to happen to her. Now she'd conceived the child, Jesus, in her womb, and as a virgin, the power of the Holy Spirit had come upon her, and she was with child carrying the Savior of the world, carrying God the Son. In verse 39, she's rushing off to her relative, Elizabeth, who's six months pregnant despite being an old woman. Let's pick it up there in Luke chapter 1 and verse 39. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, the sound of your greeting, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Oh boy, we need to read these verses about babies and joy in our days when people are saying that they don't have consciousness. But we'll carry on with this. The baby leaped for joy. Verse 45 now. And blessed is she who who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant, Behold, from now on, generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me. And holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him. From generation to generation, he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones." And exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things. And the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel. In remembrance of his mercy. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months, and returned to her home. So, what did Mary know? We just read what was perhaps the first ever Christmas poem, a Christmas hymn. Maybe they set it to music back in the early days of the church. We don't know. But certainly a magnificent piece of of poetry. It's called the Magnificat. Maybe that's what it's written as in your Bible, and that's just because the first word in Latin was picked up on many years ago, and the first word in Latin is Magnificat, which means magnify, and it's all about Mary magnifying, praising, worshipping God, her Lord. So what did Mary know? We've just read a whole poem written by a lady who obviously knew a thing or two, didn't she? She certainly knew her Bible. Unlike so many of today's young women, I must say very sadly, 90% of young women today, uh, she had never known a man before she was married, and she was still a virgin, but She knew her Bible. This psalm, this poem was full of scripture. 
and a young woman, probably not out of her teens yet, knew her God and her Bible, and she knew her Savior, and she knew what was happening to her, and her soul just overflowed with joy. And as she spilled over with joy, she wrote this wonderful poem, and oh, there's so much here that we could focus on that she knew, but I, I just want to zoom in on what two verses, actually just one long sentence that focuses on a couple of things Mary knew. Three things that Mary knew. They're all found in verses 46 and 47. So look back there. Verse 46, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Three things that Mary knew. And the first one is that she knew she had a soul. My soul, she said. And then she said, my spirit rejoices. My soul. Oh, we we have to say today, we've got to take a step back and say 2,000 years ago, people didn't seem to have so much uncertainty about this simple reality. She knew This Mary knew she she had a soul. If you ask scientists today, what kind of an answer would you get? An awful lot of scientists would tell you, you're just chemicals. You're You're just molecules. You break the molecules down into their component parts. You've got atoms, and and the atoms are just, it's just chemicals. It's just different metals, different elements, and you break it all down with just dust. Well, actually, Mary could have told you that. Because she knew probably from her Bible, Genesis 2 verse 7, that God formed man from the dust of the earth. And then, what? He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man, the Bible says, became a living soul. A living soul. You and I are more than just chemicals. Actually, scientists are beginning to catch up in November Did you read that article? The headline in the Express, not that I always read the Express, but this was the headline in the Express, Life After Death, shock claim of evidence showing consciousness may continue as a, perish the word in a newspaper, soul. Wow, the newspapers are admitting it. Well, actually, that's because a respected, greatly respected scientist has claimed that he's got some evidence for life after death. Listen to this. The possibility of life after death is one of the greatest mysteries of humanity, but now experts are claiming that there is no death of consciousness, just the death of the body. According to some well-respected scientists, quantum mechanics... You you want me to explain quantum mechanics quickly to you? All right, I'll just move on. Um, Quantum mechanics allows consciousness to live on following the body's eventual demise. This is the newspaper article. British physicist Sir Roger Penrose, all-round intelligent guy, I watched some of his stuff, he agrees and believes that he and his team have found evidence that protein-based microtubules a structured component of human cells, carry quantum information, information stored at a subatomic level. Well, you really wanted to know that, didn't you? So you're glad you came to church today. All right, what else did they say? Sir Roger added, if, and I'm abbreviating now the quote, the patient dies, it's possible that this quantum information can exist outside the body, perhaps indefinitely as a soul. Oh, at last, the words of a well-respected British scientist, Sir Roger Penrose, acknowledging that possibly, maybe, perhaps, the consciousness, when we die, does not die. And the consciousness goes on and exists outside the body as a soul, Well, that's the voice of science, and actually this teenage girl from an obscure village somewhere in Palestine 2,000 years ago could have given a bit more certainty, couldn't she? 
Genesis 2 verse 7, the Lord God formed the man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And man, mankind in Adam became a living soul. Without the breath of life, what are we? Dust, chemicals. But with the breath of life in us, you and I have a component of our makeup that will never die. Solomon, the wisest of humans before the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ as a man. Solomon, who wrote Ecclesiastes, wrote this. Remember your creator in the days of your youth. And then he he carried on at the end of his At the end of his little section in Ecclesiastes 12, he said this, Before, remember him, before the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. And you're in church today, and this is the teaching of the Bible that I have to give to you, that the Bible teaches that you are not just chemicals. You have an eternal soul that lives on when you die. And when you die, your soul, your spirit returns to God who gave it. God gave you a soul. That's what the Bible says. And science is catching up, but you know, science has always been playing catch up with God. God made the world and everything in it. And we get to look at the world and everything in it. And gradually, the more we look at it, the more we prove the existence and the wonder of our creator, God. But, you know, it's tragic, isn't it, that science is used so often to attempt to deny the existence of God. My lovely wife's grandfather spent his life. He became... He studied and became a pharmacist, and that wasn't enough. He studied and became an optometrist, and that wasn't enough. And he studied, and he became then an amateur geologist, and he pursued that study all his life, trying, trying, trying to believe in evolution, desperate to believe that the world was so old and that the Bible was not true and that we could just live as if there was no God in heaven and no judgment to come But at the end of his life, when he watched his wife die and he watched his friends die and in his 90s he came to face the inevitability of his own death. You know what he used to say? He used to say, I just, I cannot bring myself to believe that we're just chemicals. I cannot bring myself to believe that this is it. And he said, I believe in the existence of the soul. And that, for him, we believe, we hope, was the starting point of his return to the God who made him before he died. But what about you? Do you believe that you have a soul? Maybe, do you believe that God has given you a spirit? Maybe you've heard teaching about soul and spirit, and people have gone to great lengths to say that there's a spirit man, and this is different from your soul, and and different from your body, and actually, I'm not going to go through it. I'm just going to say, look, you can make up those kind of teachings by some very uh, close attention to one or two verses, but if you take the breadth of all that the Bible teaches about the soul and the spirit, the Bible uses those words interchangeably in so many places that it's almost impossible to keep in your head, uh, an adequately rational view of a difference between the soul and the spirit. I'm going to say it's almost impossible. I'm not going to say it's impossible, but let's, let's just say that for the sake of our conversation, I'm going to treat the soul and the spirit as the same basic entity in the Bible. And in fact, our verse is one of the verses that gives a hint at that. This is classic Hebrew parallelism. The different elements of these two lines are set together. My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit, paralleled with soul, exalts in God, paralleled with Lord, exalts, paralleled with magnified. You see the parallelism there. And Anyway, maybe you don't, but... 
hey, if you're into Hebrew poetry, this is really exciting stuff. <laughs> the point that I want to, to, to leave you with today is very simple. Mary knew that she had a soul. And her soul was not neglected. But the reason that I feel so passionately about this today, 2016, is as I look around and as I walk the streets of London, I see a whole generation of people living with neglected souls. Now, your soul is the part of you given by God, and God has spoken in his word the scriptures, these holy scriptures, and this stuff is food for your soul. It feeds and nourishes your soul. But you know something? You can, you can live. You can, you can go to bed watching a whole, ep, a whole series of TV shows all night. And, and you can dream all night about solving problems in reality shows that are not reality and worlds that don't actually exist. And you can wake up thinking about the characters in a show that is not real, but do you know something that is real? You have a soul. And the Bible says it's given to man once to die, and then the judgment. And your soul, when you die, is going to return to God who gave it to you, and you will face, as we all will, judgment. My wife was brought up believing in reincarnation, that this, that in the transmigration of the soul, and, and somehow we come back and back and back until we finally get it right. And, and yet, you know, what the Bible teaches is, no, there's, there's one life, one death. You have one soul, and there's one judgment to come, and, and, and you and I will be there, and we'll face that judgment. And, well, Mary knew it was happening she knew that she had this soul. She knew she couldn't neglect it. So many people are spending their life trying to feed their soul with entertainment or, or money. Jesus said this, warned about this, didn't he? He said, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? What, does that, what good does that do you? So, well... We must move on. One thing Mary knew was that she had a soul, and I hope that you know that too, but here's another thing that she knew. Secondly, she, Mary knew she had to worship God. She said, my soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. She, she, was, she understood something had just happened to her. Good things happen to you, don't they? even at Christmas. But when good things happen to you, how do you respond? Something amazing had just happened to her and she knew, I have to worship God. Our daughter is, is half American. Well, actually, she's completely American and completely British. She has dual citizenship. So... Uh, it, it, it's interesting. She was born there, and uh, Americans have this wonderful tradition of celebrating something they call Thanksgiving, and we love it because, hey, shouldn't we all stop and give thanks to God? They have another tradition about something on the 4th of July, celebrating something that happened in 1776. We do not celebrate that in our family. We, we do not want to divide it home. We're trying to teach our daughter to value and enjoy tea and to see it in its proper place. <laughs> but, you know what? Thanksgiving is a wonderful thing, isn't it? But, what is Thanksgiving about? Not just the American celebration, but what does it mean when we give thanks? When we offer up thanks? I, I, I listened to a cab driver a little while ago talk. I could hardly get a word in edgeways, and, and he was talking about, once he knew that I was religious and a pastor, and, and he was talking about how he gives thanks all the time, he just gives thanks. And, and the great question is, I, I, I think his words were something like this, this is so common, I spend a moment in thankfulness every day. 
Actually, a, a book came out recently written by a guy who interviewed so many successful people, and he said that that was one of the key factors in the lives of successful people. So now you've got lots of people who want to be successful going away saying, now I need to have a moment of thankfulness in my day. But you know, that raises a question, doesn't it? Thankfulness to whom? Who are you thanking? The universe? Is the universe so intelligent that it organized all the events in life to give you the parking space that you needed or the extra zippy toothbrush that you wanted for Christmas? Is that, is that the universe? Has the universe organized your promotion? Whatever it is, oh boy, we should be thankful, shouldn't we? But who do we give thanks to? That's a question, isn't it? Worship, and we are worshiping creatures. Mary knew she had to give thanks, but she, she knew she had to worship God, her Lord, her God. Now, I have to say this because this is a problem of our age. When you just kind of say, hmm, thank you to nobody, and I don't owe nobody nothing, you're not really saying thank you, are you, to anybody? I mean, wouldn't that be a little bit of an insult if God gave you something and you just said thank you to nothing or nobody and acted as though you don't owe that anything, that anyone anything? Actually, we can condemn ourselves by even our words of thanksgiving, but Boy, she knew she had to worship. She knew she had to worship God. And, and what a way to do it. My soul magnifies the Lord. This is worship, isn't it? When your inner being, in your inner self, you are thinking great things about God. The idea of God grows in your mind, and you are just going, wow, God. You are amazing. What you've done is incredible. That's actually worship. And, and rejoicing, my spirit rejoices in God. You know, actually, the way some people who go to church behave, you would think that worship meant being as miserable and as somber as possible and kind of muttering. And, and if they were reading this passage of the Bible, it would be something like this. It would be like... Um, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And, and that would be enough to actually make you laugh, um, but is, is that what's going on here? But stop and think for a moment. When was the last time you engaged in this kind of worship of God in your inner being. Genuinely, Jesus said, the, the, the worshipers the Father is seeking are those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. When was the last time the truth hit your mind and, and traveled from your mind to your heart in a way that just made you well up inside and say, oh God, you're wonderful. That's worship. It's a tragedy that for many people in churches, church is a duty and not a delight. Prayer is pain and not pleasure, and singing hymns are just words and not worship. That is a tragedy. And, and, and I have to say this as well, if you don't take any delight in worshiping God in your spirit, in your, with all your soul now, if that doesn't do anything for you, if, if the things of God leave you cold inside, are you really planning on going to heaven? Are you someone who is a child of heaven? Because in heaven, they worship God, the angels worshiping Him without ceasing. The worship goes on forever and ever. And, and, and is it something that appeals to you? Does the idea of meeting Jesus and seeing him face to face 
make you well up inside with joy? Or is that something actually that would just go, what? You, you know, you know, you know this is, that's the words that we use in a church, but actually it doesn't move me at all. Mary was moved. Mary was magnifying God. I should just mention as we part in passing, by the way, you can do that when you can't do anything else. You can do that from your sickbed at home. You, you, can, you can actually worship God anywhere. You, you and I, most of us in this room, couldn't have been part of this choir, but you don't need great talent to worship God with your spirit, do you? You just need a heart for it. You just need your soul to be moved with the things of God. And you can worship God in a way that the people in the choir may struggle to do because they're conscious of their standing in front of you. And I know these guys are praying every week, oh, help us to worship in spirit as we worship in word. I love that about everyone involved in this, this music team. It's such a privilege. But you know, it's actually harder up here. You can worship in your heart quite easily, without any great talent. You don't have to have money to worship God. There's that hymn, isn't there? In the bleak midwinter. And it goes something like this. If I were a shepherd, I would bring a lamb. If I were a wise man, I would do my part. Yet what I can, I give him. And what does it say next? Give my heart. And that's really my question to you today. Mary knew she had to worship God in her heart, in her inner being, with all her soul and spirit. She just wanted to worship him, and she knew she had to. And, and I hope that's true of you, is it? Is, are you wanting to worship your creator? Does that fill you with delight? Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Fa la 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 la, la 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 la, right? Tis the season to be jolly. Fa la 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 la, fa la la la. That leaves me completely cold, by the way. And you hear it in the shops. But they say it's the season to be jolly. How, how, how much, as Christians, are we rejoicing in this great, God of ours. What was it, by the way, that made Mary burst out in worship to God like this? Well, actually, this is where it gets so relevant to us today. It was the message of Christmas. This was, this was the first ever Christmas praise poem. This was just her. I think she wrapped it personally. I mean, if you're into Hebrew poetry, you know, Hebrew poetry is more kind of I don't know how it worked, but I reckon she, she was spitting lyrics here. She just, she just, she was, she was full of scripture. And to be able to spontaneously just spit this out, so beautifully poetic, so wonderfully structured. This, this was a lady who, whose heart was full. But what was it full of? It was full of the joyful reality that God had kept his promise to Israel. That God had kept his promise to send a Messiah. That Jesus Christ, the Messiah, was to be born and, and was living not even, a, not even more than a few weeks old in her womb. What did Mary know? Elizabeth had just said to her, and who am I? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. Mary, did you know that this baby is the great I am, the Lord of all creation? Did you know, Mary? Actually, I believe she did. I don't know, I don't know how she went to sleep at night, but I do believe she knew some of this, and she's... She's just bursting out with the wonder of it. Is it wonderful to you that the God of all the universe was born and conceived in a virgin conception in the womb of this young lady 
And that there, that little ball of cells, just a few weeks old, was the eternal God made flesh to come and dwell amongst us. Is that wonderful? I tell you what, it gets more wonderful because number three, she knew she had a savior. She knew she had a savior. She didn't only believe that this was the God of the universe in her belly, but she believed this was the God of the universe who had come to be born in human flesh to save us, to save us. Mary knew, number three, she had a savior. My spirit rejoices in God, my savior. This is the message of Christmas. The angel said to Joseph, it was read for us earlier, Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, you shall call his name Jesus, which means Savior, because he will save his people from their sins. I probably need to mention at this point something else about Mary that she knew, although this is not another point, but Mary knew she was a sinner. There's nothing in the Bible about immaculate conception. You know that's the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. Actually, there's many different branches of Christianity which down through the ages have gone their own way, away from the Bible as their authority, and they, popes among them, have proclaimed authoritatively that, well, one of the popes said, Mary never sinned. She never sinned. And she was born without original sin. It's in the official teaching of the Catholic Church, the Catechism, number 508. From the first instant of her conception, she was totally preserved from the stain of original sin, and she remained pure from all personal sin throughout her life. Well, that's all very good, except if that was true, she did not need a savior. But the Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, says that she said, God, my Savior. If you'd like me to go through with you, maybe this is relevant to you, I can, I can walk you through about 12 or 15 other elements of the Roman Catholic teaching about Mary from the official Catholic Church catechism and show you from the Bible why the Bible doesn't say anything like that about Mary. Mary was not without sin. She was the mother who bore, who carried God in her womb, yes. But she wasn't the mother of God. She was, it gets very confusing once you start adding up all these human additions. But if you just go back to the Bible... What we've got here is a young woman who was just over the moon because God was her savior. And God had provided a savior. And a savior from what? The angel explained that. He will save his people from their sins. So Mary knew she had sins. And Mary was happy because she had a a savior. Now, I'd be a bad pastor if I didn't just ask you. I'm sure that there are some people here tonight. A lot of people spend all their time trying to deny the fact that they're sinners. Well, you know, stop it, will you? It is a waste of time. Inwardly, trying to justify ourselves in the sight of God. Outwardly to others, coming up with excuses. Always finding a reason why we're not as bad as other people think we are. The Bible says we're sinners. We're born in sin. It's our nature. We're, we sin because we're sinners. We, 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 we can't get away from that. The Bible says that God is holy and just and he must judge sin. It's given to man once to die. And then the judgment that the judge of all the earth will have a day of reckoning with rebels... And that's when we die, when our soul goes back to God who gave it, and we have to give an account for everything done in this life. And that's kind of scary, isn't it? 
the good news, the good news is that Jesus came into the world to save sinners. People like you, people like me, people like Mary. To save us from our sin. How? Well, that's the end of the story. This is the beginning of the story, so I'm not going to talk about the end. All right, then I will. He came to die on a cross. He came to be born to live the perfect life in order to die on that cross, to, say, to, to take the punishment in himself for all the wrath of God on sin. And it says, he, he, he shall save, he will save his people from their sins. Do you have sins? Do you need to be saved from those sins? Saved from the wrath of God with you for your sins? Well, then you need a savior. And, and you know, the Bible says it's really straightforward. He's already come. He's already paid the price on the cross. And so all we have to do is, is re repent, confess our sins to him, ask him to forgive us. And, and he will because he came to save sinners. And he came to save sinners who repent. So my job today as a pastor is to reach out to you and say, it's not too late. You can be forgiven because God provided a savior. You know, and if you know that today, if you know that today, if you know that God has given you a Savior today, if like Mary you know that you have a Savior today, I hope that you'll rejoice. I hope that you'll, you'll go home rejoicing, happy as the day is long. How small are the problems in this life when you compare them to this great salvation? Mary had plenty of problems she lived in a world full of sin and social unrest and all sorts of ills, but she was able to rejoice because God had given her a Savior. Well, may that be your joy this Christmas. I want to wish you a truly happy Christmas. And it's my prayer that you'll go home today knowing that this Savior is yours. If you don't know that and you want to speak to someone afterwards, come hang out over here in the welcome area. Someone will pray with you. Someone will help you answer any questions you've got, if we can. And what, we'd love to introduce you to our Savior and allow, uh, help you in any way we can before you go.